Hello, this is Ali here. I'm one of the vicars at St. James and this is this week's sermon in English for the 20th of September 2021. We are still going through 1 Peter and so this is now 1 Peter 3 verses 15 to 18 if you want to find it in your Bibles. 1 Peter 3 15 to 18. I'm going to read it and then we'll pray. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you speak to us every day through your word. And Father, we pray that as we look at these Bible verses, that you would speak to us again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as I said, we're going through 1 Peter. Uh, Peter is talking to people who are scattered. They believe in Jesus, uh, but they're not living in the country they were born in. They are living as aliens, and they're living in a persecuted time where you could be put in prison for speaking the name of Jesus. Life for them was a balancing act of what they should and shouldn't do and what they could or shouldn't get away with in order to stay out of prison but to live a Christian life. In the West and in England we have no experience of this at all and in fact we can do anything we want which often I think leaves us doing nothing or doing as little as we can. But we are safe. We can do and say what we like. However, we believe that bad behaviour should mean punishment. It's our whole system of justice is that if you do something wrong, you end up in prison and you serve your time in prison based on how bad the thing you did that was wrong. We believe in karma. A lot of us believe in karma. Something, if you do something bad, something bad will happen to you. It's, it's a punishment lived out in life. Justice has to be served. People say whenever someone's been sent to prison for a long time, justice has been served. Someone is rotting in jail. It's another phrase we use for someone who's done something bad. The thing is, you don't learn when they're rotting in jail. For us, it's not necessarily about them changing and redeeming themselves and coming out a different person. It's about them being punished for bad behaviour. So what happens, how do we feel when the wrong person is put in prison? When someone who is innocent is put in prison? Or when someone who's guilty gets away? It makes me quite cross. It makes me really like, that's not fair, that's not right, that's not just, that's not okay. It's a miscarriage of justice. It's a shame, it makes us feel, no, it makes us feel angry actually. Now there was a man preaching the gospel in Uxbridge maybe a year and a half ago two years ago it was after the first lockdown that summer um, and he was put into prison well he was arrested and charged with hate speech and I think he did spend an hour or so in prison which is tricky because he was preaching the gospel which is a good thing to do but it meant that he ended up in prison now, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, Paul is, says that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But he wasn't arrested for being foolish, was he? He was arrested for hate speech. He was preaching the gospel, which is good news. That's what gospel means. But his good news meant that he was insulting to people. It meant that he meant he, that other people felt hated by him. The way he was telling the love story of God made some people feel hated. 
crazy, isn't it? It's really, I'm sure, not what he was about, what what was on his heart, but it's what happened. Foolishness and feeling hated and insulted is not the same thing. If people were looking at him preaching and saying, oh, what a foolish man, he A, he wouldn't be arrested, and B, that's fine. But they didn't look at him and say, oh, what a foolish man. They looked at him and said, how awful that he's saying that. That's awful to me. That hurts my feelings. That hurts me. Peter says, when someone asks you to give an account of what you believe, be respectful and gentle. There's three things there. When someone asks, it's by invitation. I will share my faith with anyone at pretty much the drop of a hat but only when they ask I have no right to impose when they ask and I will be gentle and respectful I've got a couple of things that I look, like to do that I like to think about when I'm talking to people about what I believe so I'm going to share them with you there's three things one Jesus says do to other people as you'd have them do to you which means that I need to address someone and think about someone the way that I'd want them to think about me so I never compare my faith with anyone else's. You believe this, so, and, but I believe this. Why? Because when you compare something, something always comes off worse. Something's always not as good as the first thing, which is the point. But how does that person feel? Oh, you're saying that my faith is rubbish or harmful or hurtful, but your faith is better. That's harmful and hurtful, isn't it? It's not nice. I don't want you to compare. The other problem with comparing is in Islam, there are three main groups. In Hinduism, there are hundreds of groups. In Judaism, there are different rules and different ways of being Jewish. And in Christianity, we've got Orthodox and Catholic and Protestant and Methodist and Evangelical. And someone from a different faith group comes to you and says, I know about Christianity. And I know that Islam is better. You'd be like, you don't know what I believe. You know what some people who believe in Jesus believe, but you don't know what I believe. It's my faith. Don't tell me what I believe. It's exactly the same. Never tell somebody what they believe. And then compare what you think they believe to what you believe. Because it's never respectful. You can't possibly understand everything someone believes. Don't defend Jesus. Number two. Don't defend Jesus. Peter says, be ready with an answer. You can defend your faith. I believe this because you don't have to defend Jesus. He can defend himself. He's big enough to defend himself. And the other thing is, when you get defensive, how dare you say that about me? Actually, you come across as aggressive. And that is not gentle. Paul, Peter says, be gentle. So as soon as I defend my defend Jesus, I become aggressive. And as soon as I become aggressive, I stop being gentle. And as soon as I stop being gentle, the words I'm speaking stop being good news. Number three, keep your conscience clear. If you get frustrated apologize. If someone starts defending themselves, it's generally because you've hit a nerve and they feel a little bit like they need to defend themselves, which means you can pull back. You don't want to hurt someone. Of course you don't. They're made in the image of God. So apologize. I'm so sorry if I've hurt you, that you need to defend yourself. If you forget to listen, apologize. Keep short accounts with people. If you're looking and they look, they think, oh, if I hurt you, I'm sorry. And listen again. It's a conversation. It's about you. You don't have to defend anything. There's nothing to defend. God is able to defend himself. That way, no one can accuse you of hate speech. Because you're not being hateful. Remember verse 17. It is better to get arrested in gentleness and respect so that when they look and someone says oh she was doing this wrong everybody around will say no she was just 
and listening and talking. She wasn't showing hate. So what does that look like then, to get arrested for being kind and gentle? We see a pattern, and Peter points it out to us in Jesus. That awfulness we feel when there is a miscarriage of justice, Jesus went through that for us. He never sinned, but died for sinners. Peter is really clear with his words here. He never sinned, but died for sinners to bring them home. And then Peter changes the pronoun and he doesn't say them anymore. He says to bring you home. That awfulness when we, we feel when there's a miscarriage of dust, that's not fair. Jesus walks into it willingly because you are worth it. That's the good news of the gospel. You are worth that shame. So as usual, Jesus takes the world's justice and he turns it on his head. Before, the honourable thing, honourable situation is when you do something wrong, you are punished. That's the plan. But Jesus does nothing wrong and is punished. And God, in verse 17, if that's God's will, God is pleased. God is pleased when we are gentle and respectful and face a punishment that is really someone else's. And this can happen all the time. But what we must not do when this does happen is take on the shame that other people would put with that punishment. Because, as we've just read, Jesus takes our shame when he died to bring us home. So when someone does something wrong and he suffers, or they suffer, we call that justice. But God's justice... It's Jesus having done nothing wrong to bring us home and we celebrate that and we call it grace. So there is no honour in earthly justice, really. There's no honour in doing something wrong and there's no honour in going to prison. And actually, once you come out again the other side, there's very little honour in that as well. In God's justice, Jesus dies and takes our sin so that we go home and there is honour in that sacrifice. And as we follow that pattern that is Jesus, we react kindly and respectfully for those around us. If we find ourselves being the, the brunt or being the focal point of misjustice, we are simply following the way of Jesus, because that's what Jesus did before. He gave everything up to bring us home and called it grace. Because of Jesus then, we are found honourable. This is gospel truth, isn't it? It's good news. Jesus takes that punishment that we should have taken and calls it justice. And in that pattern, we pass that on. We are good and we are respectful and we are gentle and we are kind and we are loving and we share when it's asked of us. And we live in such a way that we're begging people to ask it of us. And then when we share, if people get upset, if people, if we end up, if someone, we we're happy to be put out because that's what Jesus did. We're happy to be the brunt of someone else's bad temper and bad day, because that's what Jesus did. Now, obviously, I'm talking about a man in Uxbridge. I'm talking about you and I sharing our faith. I'm not talking about an abusive relationship or, or child protection. And I would always say, if you're in a situation where you are not safe, you need to leave. At least temporarily. But your safety is more important. However, in this context, we take everybody else's rubbish because Jesus took ours. And it's not something we moan about and it's not something that we're very proud about. It's just the thing that happens and that's okay because Jesus did it. And we're walking around 
clothed in his honour that he gives us and we call it grace. So this week as we wander around, I pray that we will live lives that are so intriguing that people ask why. Why do you do that? They give us an opening, so kind of them, for us to share the good news that we believe. And as we share, we listen as much as we speak. We don't compare our faith with somebody else's. We don't defend Jesus because he's big enough to defend himself. And we know that whatever happens, even if the worst thing in Western culture happens and there's a mis miscarriage of justice, that Jesus has been before us. And the way that he carried that miscarriage of justice has brought us life. And that is grace. And that's our good news. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you carry the sins of the world to bring it home, to bring the world home, to bring us home. We thank you, Father, for your great love. Teach us, Father, to share your story, your truth with those around us from a place of gentleness and respect. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a lovely week, St. James. Thank you for listening. Bye.